Chris. Uh, I worked for Mozilla until a few days ago, and uh, I've worked about 20 years in IT and different departments and different environments. And now I got asked to be here today because I'm dating inside Spotify and I come for free. And um, they asked me to talk at a conference about diversity, which is kind of bizarre. So the conference here is called, or the meeting here is called Diversify, but I want to call you out to actually start with Diversified. Because I think there is a massive problem that we have right now with diversity that what we had in the past got lost. Because uh, when I started in the web world, diversity was much, much more normal. And nowadays we're getting into a world where we have to fight for seeing female developers, or we fight for seeing people of color people with different backgrounds, and I think it's kind of sad that we do it that way. But first of all, how silly do I feel? Because I'm speaking at a diversity event, and I'm first of all male, second of all half able-bodied, like, I mean, I have glasses, I've got flat feet, and I've got a few fillings and stuff, so, um, yeah, I also have red hair, but that's not generally a disability, <laughs> but it's seen as something like that from time to time. I'm also kind of a geek. Um, which comes with the territory, I guess. And when it comes to being white, I think there's not much that you can do about it, much more white than that. And then they ask me to speak at a diversity event, how it feels to be a white guy in IT. <laughs> Quite, kind of natural, <laughs> what I want to say. Um, diversity is a very important issue, and I think it's something that makes us grow by being understanding for other people's differences and using those differences to our advantage and learning from other people. It's also right now a massively hot topic. I mean, you all follow Twitter, the whole Gamergate thing and the whole thing about GitHub before, and um, I use the flame thing here to say that it's a hot topic because it's hot, not because it's sexual. So if you say hot in an environment in office, it can go wrong. So these kind of things you have to worry about these days. But also, you always had to worry about them, but nowadays it's much more obvious to us. It's also a very ridiculously complex issue, because a lot of times we talk about diversity, and also at this event to a degree, we talk about like women in tech. But in reality, diversity is about race, is it about gender, is it about sexual orientation? And how do you define that even nowadays? I mean, when I look into friends of mine who are differently sexually orientated than I am. There are so many splinter groups, I wouldn't have enough time to look into that. It's just amazing how many are out there. It's about religion. I mean, in Sweden, not that much of an issue, but in other countries, like there's religious problems and religious issues with each other. Hair color, again. Ability, origin, or age. Age is something that's not talked about much. We talk about there's not enough women in IT, in IT but try to be a 45-year-old developer and go to the Silicon Valley to a few startups and apply for a job. See how that works out. We don't talk about it yet, because we're not that age yet. I might be soon, if I don't live like I do right now. As people of the web, we tend to favor quick generic solutions for complex issues. There's a great book, well, great book, a good blog post. The book is rather hard to take in. It's called To Save Everything, Click Here. It's, uh, it shows that we have this a folly of technology solutionism. Like everybody thinks there's a solution, a technology solution to something. And if we show a technology hackathon, then we care. My favorite was a few weeks ago when somebody in the Financial Times or something wrote an article about the homelessness in San Francisco. And I was retweeting it. And then the city of San Francisco was tweeting back to me and saying like, yeah, but we have a hackathon where we talk about homelessness. <laughs> And I was just thinking, yeah, all these 19-year-old white developer kids will really know the problems of homeless people and we'll find a technology solution for them. They give every one of those an iPhone, and then they can actually call their Uber and whatever. It's just a very strange thing what we're trying to do here. We also aren't the best when it comes to patience. We want to solve something immediately, and we want to solve it within one hackathon or from one week of work week or something like that. And diversity is an issue that takes a much longer time, especially when you see that there's a history and there's a tradition of, uh, of non-diversity in some environments. There's a story I want to tell you that happens to me, uh, happened to me a few days ago. Um, when I travel early in the morning, like this morning, I had to be at the airport at 7.45 was my flight, so I had to get up at 5.30, 4.30 actually, I got up to have the shower and everything. And when I fly that early, I basically pack everything up in my house. I put my suitcase together, I put my clothing that I'm going to wear the day uh, on the flight on top of the suitcase, I do my washing, I do my cleaning up, and I put my rubbish together. 
I live on the sixth floor in London, so I have to go down a, a set of stairs, have to go through a coded door where I always forget the code, have to open the door with a key that I normally forget upstairs as well, and then have to go to the rubbish bin, have another key, open that one, and put the rubbish in there. So I make sure that I have all the rubbish in the evening, go down, throw it away next morning, just get my suitcase and get out of the house. And then I found three bananas in my kitchen. And I was, as a developer, I was thinking, the best way of doing this is peel the bananas and throw the banana peels away with the rest of the rubbish, and next morning eat the bananas. <laughs> it sounded very clever, and then I realized, hang on, bananas without the peel in the room overnight is probably not too yummy in the morning. But we find these like quick solutions, this is the best way of doing oh, unless this happens, or this happens, or this happens. So we think far too, far too quick for the solution rather than analyzing the problem, really. And this doesn't work with diversity. This doesn't work with saying like, oh, well, we just hire more developers who are female. That's fine, and then we are a diverse company. It's a culture change. It's an environment change. So we need to fix ourselves. And that is hard. That is annoying because we don't want to admit that we have problems. We never want to admit that we, that we are. We don't want to see ourselves as racist. We don't want to see ourselves as misogynistic or something like that. We think we're open-minded. But we have many, many things in ourselves where we just don't quite know why that happens and why we are thinking in a certain way. So in order to achieve, achieve diversity, we have to overcome our biases, which is an interesting one because a bias is something that you think somebody has, like somebody hates people of a certain color. That's a bias. But we see somebody of a certain color and we have subconscious ideas about that. If we, for example, are my parents, have never seen anybody of color in their village in, in Germany in the 40s, there was nobody there. So the first people that moved in for them were like a prototype for every other color person. This was, um, I don't know if it's here, huh? no. And this is hard. Overcoming these biases is really annoying because we don't want to face them. We just want to think that we're super clever and super open to everything. Conscious biases are not hard to battle. Like, if you're conscious, consciously hating somebody because of their creed, their color, their religion, or their sexuality, then you're basically just a dick. That's not a problem at all to overcome. And this is the Will Wheaton's law of the internet. I bet we could explode a galaxy if we could stop being dicks for like five minutes. And that's good. Sometimes you realize, I hate something because I just hate it. I never analyzed it. And then you realize, okay, I don't hate it anymore. Fair enough. Also, there's the other problem is the, um, is the greater internet fuckwad theory, which is a normal person with perceived anonymity and an audience becomes a total idiot. You find this on mailing lists, you find this on Twitter, you find this on Stack Overflow, you find this in every discussion of the internet. As soon as people think they're anonymous, they can get away with something, they try to be that really cool person. The anonymous, I'm not talking anonymous, the, the group, I'm talking about people that are just trolling and thinking out of a sudden they cannot be caught anymore. The good thing is there is no anonymity on the web anymore. That's a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing in this case. So whatever you say online, think about it going to a pub to the meanest, biggest person in the pub and saying it to their face. If you can say that, then you can also say it online. If not, you will get punched in the pub and you should get punched online as well. So just don't be a terrible person online because you think you're anonymous. Unconscious biases are much harder. These are things that are in our brain and that just happen to be there the first day. And, um, yeah. Where might this person be from? Listen to that a bit. I am not the one to have against you, not against you. I am a wicked man. This is a wicked man. If you don't have a poor guy, otherwise you don't have a poor woman. Why are some of those kids? They're not going to make you rich. <laughs> this was this morning, my cab driver in London. A man that lived in London for 40 years, has several kids there, has a family there, spoke the broadest Jamaican accent I ever heard. He talked me his, his life story for an hour, I still don't know what he said. But he was super happy to share with me, and that's what I love about living in London. Like, he just expects me to understand an accent that is completely different from mine. And he just is happily sharing it with me. Other cab drivers would never do that. 
And I find it really, really cool that you have these kind of things. But you hear somebody like that for the first time, you're like, I could never find a relationship with that person. I could never talk to them. I don't know what's going on. But after asking three, four times and repeated the words I'd understood, and we had a conversation. Do yourself a favor and put an hour out of your life and watch that video. It's called Unconscious Bias at Work from Google Ventures. And it shows you how we are biased. How we understand something, how we, how we make decisions that are bad without wanting to. How we basically have been conditioned by our environments and by what we've done before and how we grew up and where we grew up and what comes out of it. And it, it is a, a thing inside Google that they've done consciously, weirdly enough, uh, that they made sure that the unconscious bias doesn't become part of the work environment, of the hiring environment, of the uh, uh, of the the way people are promoted anymore, and that's why they try to improve diversity in the company. It's a very, very insightful one hour of, uh, of, of watching a talk, and it's very interesting to see. He talks about in there about uh, implicit uh, uh, bias checking, implicit association tests, and they're online on Project Implicit, which is a Harvard education uh, website, and also on understandingprejudice.org. There's a lot of tests which are localized to different countries. So this is a Swedish one here, and there's an English one, there's, a, there's an American one, there's a German one, and so on and so forth. But with these tests, you realize just how biased you are without wanting to be, which is a terrible feeling, but it's good, because then you learn how to overcome that, you understand it. And the fun thing is that when, you, when they did these tests with people, there is no such thing as like men hating women more than women hating women. Everybody's as biased because it goes back to our history as humans. We are going out there and if we stop looking around, we get eaten by saber-toothed tigers. We don't have these problems anymore, but these fears are still in our heads. So everything that is not us seems to be something that we're scared of, first of all. Unconscious biases are part of what we are. It's something that we got from our parents. It's something that we got from our environments. And it's something that we can only overcome once we analyze that we have them. Without them, we make gut decisions that are based on the things, how we grew up and what we fought before. In my case, um, I was brought up in Germany. And uh, there's a lot of things there that are different than America. The first time I moved to America, I had to lo a lot to understand about people around me. Germany, like Sweden, is very much like uh, the, uh, a sexual innuendo joke is possible. Like, people are very much open about their sexuality. People are very much open about harsh humor. The German humor, yes, we have them. People say we don't. It's brutal. But at the same time, it's honest. And you couldn't do this in America, where basically people are very offended very quickly by other things. But at the same time, they do things that offend us. The thing about it is, it's stereotypes that are coming up about all these different environments, and you can have fun with them. And I want to show you a quick video of a TV series, which is blatant copyright infringement. But uh, the TV series got cancelled anyway, so up to them. Um, but it's a very, very interesting little sketch, and I thought it was very funny, so let's take a look at that together. And I mean, this is all fun and games, and the American TV shows are really good at that. They're showing like people in, in the offices talking to each other and being like, really cool about it and ripping on each other, and it's all fun and games. And then you try it in real life, and it's an AIHR violation. Because if you think about it, what happened there, is it actually okay to make fun of someone's accent? It's fun. It's a German guy. It doesn't really matter. It's like a country that, that is not that poor. It's not really an educational thing. But could you make fun of somebody's accent if they're North, Ameri North African? Or if it's somebody from a Muslim country, is it okay to make fun of that accent then? And no, it isn't. And I find it very funny, um, when I go to America, and I, I spoke at 42 conferences in 27 countries in the last few years. I, I'm, I'm invited to a lot of conferences as a speaker. And at one conference in America, I, I wasn't that known, it was a new environment that I was there. And I gave my talk, and then later on I, f I looked at the Twitter stream, and the first thing was like, oh my god, that's an awesome accent, was the first tweet. And then 50 tweets like, oh, get to the chopper and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger jokes and all kind of things. And I was like, okay, first of all, it's Austrian and German are two different accents. It's saying like Swedish and Danish is the same thing. 
And secondly, I felt like, okay, I spend about 12 hours researching this talk. I spend about six hours writing it and doing the slides. I spend about two hours rehearsing it. And everything that people on Twitter talked about is my accent. They reduced me to an accent. And this is, of course, not as bad as female speakers being reduced to what they're wearing or how big their breasts are. But it's as hurtful. It is as wasteful. And I think it's something we should think about when we talk to people and we make fun in public and we wonder what's going on. Because I didn't go there to talk about my accent. I could have done a stand-up routine if I wanted to and made jokes about Germans, which I love doing. Because, I mean, I love, I left that country 20 years ago, so it's all good. <laughs> but it's not cool to make fun of someone's accent and then just, you, you don't even hurt the person, but you just move away from the subject matter. You make it a ridiculous thing. You limit someone to one of their uh, ideas or one of their um, assets, so to say. Is it fun to make, uh, is it okay to make fun of people not understanding you? Like when he made, made a joke about her not understanding his word the right way. In a TV series, totally. In an environment like an office, terrible. And I think that's one of the worst things that people keep doing. And every single American TV comedy show has something in there. There's always a group where someone doesn't understand something, the others, instead of explaining to that person what he said wrong, make fun of it and move it on and tell them more wrong things. And imagine coming into an office and being unhappy already and being like thinking you're not good enough. And then you say something wrong and people make jokes and tell you more wrong things rather than explaining to you what's wrong. So please, when you talk to somebody and they say something wrong, this could be somebody from a different environment, like from HR or from sales, and they come and talk to you about like, oh, Java and JavaScript, it's the same thing. Interrupt nicely and explain why there is a difference. Educate people rather than just keeping a joke on. Laughing about each other is not bringing us anything. And especially going back to the accent thing as well, I, I coach public speaking, and we're all unhappy about our accents, even the native speakers. So when that is the thing that you point out to somebody, then they shut up even more and close up even more. That's not how you get people out of their shell. When people visit me in England, um, uh, Germans, I get them drunk because then they start speaking English. Before that, they're worried about their accent. Same with Swedish people, but you get drunk anyways because it's so much cheaper over there. <laughs> but it's just important to understand that pointing out an asset that people are not very worried, very happy about and shining a big light on it is never a good way to deal with people. Is it okay to make assumptions based on someone's ethnic background? Is it okay to say like, oh, if you're German, you're probably organized. You do that. I'm too lazy to do it. I mean, there's positive, there's negative prejudice. It's the same thing. Like, you kind of go to a Chinese person, like, you're good at math, right? Like, what if they're not? They must feel doubly bad then, you know? <laughs> I failed, my, I failed my, my stereotype. Is it okay to have a sexual relationship in the office with a client? Probably not. It's a very, very... What if you break up and you have to be still on the same team? That's such, such an awkward, awkward environment. This is where it's funny when we have these IT companies that lock people in for their whole life and make the office their home. Like, okay, well, you can start dating, but you won't find anybody unless they're on the bus in the morning or something like that. You have to have a social life as well. And this is where it gets really, really problematic. The breakup things. The problem with life is that it goes on after the happy ending. In movies, there's always the happy end. Everything worked out. In life, you would have to pay all the cars that were broken in the car chases and these kind of things. And the same with relationships. It's happy now, but then you're like, hey, didn't you talk to that other lady before? And like, whatever. I think it's very important if we want to fix ourselves to rise above where we are and where you came from. So a lot of things that are okay in Germany, I don't do in America because they're not okay there. A lot of times when I went to, uh, went to Middle East or when I went to Africa and these places, I just learned a lot about the environments before I did something. And just that looking up, made me overcome my unconscious biases to a degree. I think it's also be aware of your background and how it influences you. My dad's a coal miner. My whole family worked in factories. I was the first one to just go to high school. I was the first one to ever touch a computer. My parents have not touched a computer yet. They don't have a smartphone. They have an old number phone that they forget to charge. They just call people on their landline at home. And uh, it influenced me as well, of course. I feel guilty when I get free stuff. I feel uh, when I go to MIT and gave a talk in there, I was so super proud. I was just uh, like, my, I'm giving a talk at MIT. I have no idea how clever these people in the audience are. Probably much more than me. 
And I called my mom and I'm like, I'm at MIT. They're going to find out that you haven't been to university. <laughs> it's like, yeah, mom, uh, it's okay. I can be in university as a lecturer. I don't have to have a degree for that. Like, yeah, but that's for rich people, right? Isn't that too costly to go to university? And you're like, no, that's not why it is. But these backgrounds influence us as well. And it's tough to overcome all of that. It's really hard to get out of that shell and be not you, what your parents were or, don't, uh, uh, or learn for yourself instead of trusting the, uh, the ideas your parents had because you grew up and you learned everything from them. And that's why they thank God for teenage rebellion. As a teenager, you just hate everything your parents do and you do it completely differently. I sang in a punk band. I did all kind of random stuff on computers that is totally illegal and would get me to jail if I tried to do that now. But it taught me how to protect my software later on. And this is important that we go through that step and that we get it out of our system. And that actually accumulates later on at high school and college. I mean, I don't know what's going on there, but it's probably somewhere in college or high school because nowhere else you can do something like that. And you get it out of your system and it's done and then you become a professional and you go to work. And I was so, so lucky. I always wanted to find the world. I mean, I grew up in this 3,000 people village that I didn't like because whatever you did, people knew immediately. And when I did a lot of things as a teenager, people knew it, went to my parents about it. So I, I went to the motorway and just looked at like the trucks from different countries. And I'm like, this is so cool. I want to be in different countries. And I was 18. We have mandatory army service. I refused to go to the army because back then the army meant being shouted at for three months and then drinking for nine months because we were not allowed to be outside of our borders anyway. So I'm like, this is a year wasted on something that I should have done, got a job, got some money because that's what my parents want me to do. So I worked for the Red Cross instead. And the Red Cross, I, uh, I taught a group of people with learning disabilities how to cook for themselves, how to wash for themselves, how to get the traffic light without being run over, and all these bits and bobs. And I also work with the elderly. And a lot of these people that are very, very old and are still fit and are still happy are the ones that traveled and had lots and lots of experiences. And then that's when I swore to myself, I'm going to find a job where I can travel. And if somebody offers me a job somewhere else, I say yes and I go. And this is how my career started in IT, in web development. I moved to America because I needed to, because they wanted me over there for a project. I, broke off everything at home, I went over there, I went to England, I stayed in England for 15 years now, I went to India for half a year, and all of these were experiences that I got paid for getting. And this is all that you have here now as well, these opportunities you have. The more experience you get, the more your biases will go away. And in the early internet working days, it was really, really good because there was no relevant degree. Nobody asked for a degree because no university offered you anything that had to do with web development. Because web development was still fluctuating. We still didn't know what it was like. As soon as the thing showed up on screen, people were happy. There was no development processes. There was no like build scripts and like package managers and all the things that we have right now. A lot of times you live coded on FTP so, which is a terrible idea. But it was the only thing we had back then. There was no media attention. The media hated the internet because they were afraid. They weren't like the media that we have now where it's like, oh, look at all these cool startups, how many millions of dollars they make. Like our whole uh, market, like the whole in, uh, environment is basically shot. The IT market is the only one that makes some money and hires people at the moment. So everybody looks at us and everybody pushes us and wants something from us. Back then we're like, yeah, this internet thing will never work out. Here's a newspaper. Everybody wants to have print. And there's no rules. Know the bugs. Make it work. My career at the beginning was knowing how Internet Explorer 4 and 5 makes things wrong and not do them wrong. And it is sad that the career started like that, but it's still kind of that way. But it was good because it meant there was a superbly diverse, diverse working environment. It wasn't only computer science students that did web development and IT. It was all kind of people. They came from all kind of environments, print designers, screen designers, programmers, um, writers, business analysts, project managers, database admins, webmasters, and webmistresses. Webmistresses, I always loved that. Because I knew so many people that had a second career in web development. They had a career, then they had children, stayed at home, because in America you cannot have be a mother and have a career, sadly enough, it seems. So they became webmaster later on and made little websites for other people and made an extra living with that. Nowadays, probably not possible anymore, because everybody wants to have that super scrolling website with 10,000 things in there and implemented with all kind of cloud services, which you cannot do with Dreamweaver. 
maybe this is what we should be going. But I think it's sad that this diversity of people getting into IT and having as a second career is more or less gone because become, it became much more powerful. If you had the knowledge, you were allowed to work. Nobody asked for your degree, nobody asked for your experience, because there was no experience yet. And the experience came later, that's when the new roles came in. I love this with Bob Ross, talent is a pursuit interest, in other words, anything that you're willing to practice, you can do. And it's kind of true, like, I can't paint anything, but I, the more I do it, the better it gets. So don't worry about new talents, try them out. There were many different environments that I worked in over my career. Small businesses, you know, the ones that want everything for free and cheaper and yesterday. Um, enterprise, which want everything written in like 500 pages before you write two lines of code. Content management systems, and these were the ones that are six-figure ones, you know, like vignettes, documentum. The ones where you pay £350,000 for a license and then you pay £3,000 for every developer that works on it to learn how to use that thing. It's, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, kind of. Like, if the thing is that expensive, it should be easier to use, right? No, it was so complex. Local government, oh my God, that was fun. But seeing, for example, that, um, that Hammersmith and Fulham, which in London is a very, very wide neighborhood from when you walk around, speaks 73 languages, and I had to release the website in 73 languages, including Arabic and Hebrew with the whole right-to-left thing, that taught me so many cool things that I would never have had in a small business website. E-commerce stuff, B2B, maps, geolocation, photo media, banking. I jumped from all these environments and it was exciting because all of them had different needs and different people in them as well. Talking to a developer that works in banking and talking to a developer that works for Flickr was a completely different world between those two. But they all had good ideas, so I just sponged them in and got them there. The main learning that I had was that sharing beats competing. The more you share with other people what you learned the more you will get them to do things for you and you've got free time to do something else. You also can do weird things that strange people do, like taking a holiday or getting sick. You know, when I promoted people in my team, the more they shared with the rest of the team, not who's the rock star who knows everything. Because if that rock star goes away, you have a hole. You don't know how to fix a product. You don't know what to do with it. Different people are better than different things. I had a project where I, li uh, I lived in India and the project was three months overdue and I think £60,000 in the, in the miners already. And I managed to turn it around within another month by just empowering the people over there. Instead of seeing them as a deliverer that didn't deliver good enough, I asked them, what is your interest? What do you like to fix? What annoys you most? What, what is most broken about this project that you want to fix? And then I let them fix it. And we managed to turn this thing around in a month. I was in... I was happy, very, very happy that I worked in Yahoo next to a blind developer for two years. A blind PHP developer that wrote PHP faster than I did by listening to what he's typing. The person that when there was in inaccessible websites, I installed a Grease Monkey for him. He wrote JavaScripts to fix those websites and then sent those JavaScripts to the, to the site providers. You know, it wasn't one of those complaining people that basically say like, oh, you made it inaccessible to me. You're a bastard. No, he fixed it for himself and then explained to people how to fix it as well, which is like teaching and showing. It was just gorgeous to see. My favorite was that every Christmas party, we had a, an, e uh, an email coming with a beautiful JPEG of, the, uh, of where the Christmas party is. And of course, JPEG, first of all, like artifacts, like looked horrible. But secondly, of course, he, as a blind person, gets a JPEG and an email, nothing. So every single year he had to complain to HR, the people people, that basically he cannot read that and if there's a text version of that one. Until the last year before I left, he sent the email and he's like, oh God, again. Well, um, uh, sorry, can I get this as a text because I can't read it? And the email from somebody in HR came back like, what are you, blind? <laughs> and then he copied that person, her boss, the director in our press department and <laughs> just emailed it back, yes. <laughs> But yeah, these are people people. They should know this, and even they make mistakes. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very fascinating when you work with somebody with a disability, like a blind web developer for a long time, and we made the most brutal jokes to each other. Like, we were both German. Well, he was Portuguese German or whatever. But it's like, I'm like, oh, you just don't see the big picture, do you? <laughs> but if you find people, when they start talking to blind people, we have so many idioms in the English language that has to do with seeing, because seeing is not only seeing, but also understanding. Like, don't you see? Oh, no, you don't. You know? It's, 
It's funny how people try to avoid them then and become these robots that don't know how to communicate any longer rather than like, I know I might do something wrong here, but I hope you're not offended. Please tell me when I'm out of line. And that's as much as it takes, really. So no environment is forever is another one I learned as well. Like I work with so many languages and content management systems and server environments. Like don't think that the thing that you're concentrating on right now will be there for, there for the next 20 years. These things change. PHP by now is a joke to a lot of people and what's the cool thing when I switched from Perl to PHP? All of a sudden everything was really, really easy. And the only constant is change. And that's kind of cool. That's why I work in IT. That's why I work on the web. Because I want to punish myself learning something new every single day. If I had a job that I can read from a pamphlet and never have to do again, I would be bored really, really quickly. And you can help something, make something new every day. But the main learning I had is that the more diversity in the team, the better the product. The more backgrounds of environments, of knowledge, of also cultural environments we had, the better the product got. I loved when I, when I, when I had a team and I had uh, my first female employee as a developer. It was just, wow. Because, not because I found somebody, but out of a sudden, the competition in the team com changed completely. All of a sudden, everything became much more human. It wasn't like this, like, five guys running against each other, who's the coolest coder and who has the least social life, you know? It became, out of a sudden, a human thing. Like, hey, we're a group of people. Like, oh, let's, let's go for lunch together and do something like that. The, the whole structure changed, and I loved that. Well, let's fast forward to now. What do we have now? There are more jobs than people, and communication to recruiters is broken. I wrote that blog post a few days ago. And it just hurts me right now, because I get, I mean, you probably as well, the people who work here at Spotify, you get about 10 job offers a day through LinkedIn, through emails, and all of them are like not at all what you are. These recruiters just send random things out. They found you on GitHub, they found you on LinkedIn, and they send you things because they have numbers to fulfill. And... With my background that I explained before, that being a coal miner, a factory worker, half my family is either unemployed or very, very unhappy in their jobs and have no idea how to find a new job. And I feel guilty getting job offers that I cannot take or I don't want to take or I feel like, oh, I'm too good for those. I'm too good for a job when there's so many unemployed people out there? Like, we should break that. We should find a way to get people who are not the perfect rock stars back into IT because there's so many jobs to actually do here. And we're not working on something that is a piece of software. We're working on the Internet. And the Internet, to me, is just the evolution from radio to TV to Internet. It's a new medium where everything happens. And this is a human thing. This is not an algorithm thing. Algorithm makes it better. But in the end, you have to talk to humans. And you need different, diverse people to do that. There's this whole rock star bullshit going on in TechCrunch. Like this 18-year-old super ninja rock star coder makes millions of this awesome new startup while you're boring fast try to fix CSS glitches. That was not a real headline, strangely enough. But I've got developer tools. I can do these kind of things. But this is what the tech press basically says. I was at a, uh, in a European Commission um, a forum for young entrepreneurs looking for European Commission government funding. And I was on a panel about startups and what they could do to be successful. Don't know why, but I probably have a lot of experience in this. Not that I had a startup ever, but fair enough. And it was this person next to me from a company that I don't want to mention here right now. But he was basically saying to a group full of people who are entrepreneurs who try to get more funding, it's so easy nowadays to be an entrepreneur. The cost of software is zero. Open source, everything is available to you. You can get the best software just from GitHub and you can start using it. Servers are cheap. You can use the cloud to get like lots and lots of scaling technology for your startup. So there's nothing that stops you from starting your business in the garage in your Silicon Valley house or something and you basically make millions in the first two months. And I was like, can I interrupt for a second? First of all, open source is not free. Open source is open source. It's more than that. You, you can use a, a, an open source system, but you, you still have to teach your engineers how to use them. And they also have to pick the right one because there's thousands and thousands of, of them out there. Which one is reliable? Which one has been around for a long time? Which one fits the needs of my project? So free doesn't mean it doesn't cost you anything because you have to put time and effort into understanding it and using it. And if you really, really care for open source, then you just don't use it for free, but you also give back to it. 
you put something back into the open source system. That's why it's open, that's why it is free. Because we expect you to help us make it better, at least by fighting bugs against it. Secondly, the cloud is cheap at the beginning. As soon as you get the first hit from like TechCrunch or Hacker News, all of a sudden there's a five-digit number on your, on your bill. And where does that money come from if you're just a startup that wants to try something out quickly? Traffic is not as cheap as it looks at the beginning. Like you can get a free server really easily. Azure or Microsoft gives you something if you want to if you send them an email. But then all of a sudden, like, oh my god, so much traffic. And the traffic that comes from the tech crunches, from the hacker news and all these, don't bring you money. They just bring you traffic. You get this spike and then you have to be really, really quick to use that attention and turn it into something that brings you profit. And thirdly, we in Europe here, we're in a room full of entrepreneurs who have been around for a year, for a year and a half, and want to go for the second round of uh, money from the European government. And you tell them that you can be a multi-million dollar company in the first month. So you basically told everyone in the room that they're losers. Because they actually spend a year on something. They could be millionaires already. So these Cinderella stories are complete nonsense. I think it's time to stand up against the tech press and say like, I'm sorry, we heard this more than enough. Show us the numbers. Show us how many startups are really, really happening that are successful. I think Spotify here has one main difference. If Spotify had set out to be just a music streaming service, it would not be around any longer. But it had an idea of saying, we want to make piracy of music unnecessary. We want to do whatever we can to make music legally available in a cheap fashion in an affordable fashion, without ripping off the, the music and without ripping off the music industry. And that's why they, made, they were a success. They had an idea and not only a technology. It's a world of competition. It's all competition, startup competitions, hackathons, like, oh my god, in 24 hours, show us what you can do and show us what's going on. In companies internally, uh, it's a very old system from the 80s that if you have a large corporation, you split it up into lots of different little departments that compete with each other for bonuses. That way, you keep everybody on their toes and you get everybody excited about their own bonus, but you don't make them work with each other. But that's what we have right now, and it's getting more and more. The more media attention we have, the bigger these little webs and all the other startup competitions will get, and everybody is like feeling inadequate if we're not in a few months make a lot of money. And I find, it, I find it ridiculous that money is not growing on trees, sadly enough. It's also a world of higher barriers of entry. In the past, web development was rather easy. Nowadays, we tell each other that we need Grunt, Gulp, and Bauer, and everything to start building our first websites or you're not professional. Which is true if you want to scale to the size of Facebook, to Spotify, to Google. But think about the pre-peeled bananas. A lot of this stuff is premature optimization. Make something that works and make something that is clean and easy to understand, then make it scale later on. It's better than relying on 12 different layers of abstraction. And you shock a lot of people that might be interested in doing something. I know a lot of people that were very excited about CSS and don't do it anymore because now everything is SaaS and preprocessors. And they're like, I don't know how to do that anymore. I feel stupid. I feel inadequate at times. And I've written CSS engines. And I just feel that we're trying to show off to each other, have a competition amongst each other, who's got the best tools, who's got the most effective tools, while we're actually not concentrating on releasing something out there. It's a world of throwaway products. When that was one of the things that annoyed me the most. <coughs> Move fast and break things. Oh, how arrogant is that? Like, so write code and throw it away next week. Write code, throw it away tomorrow. This is whatever you do is really of no longevity. There's no interest in actually writing something that's readable because it's a 1% history and a 1% journey. They changed their wording now as well. So they got a bit away from that. But this is the arrogance that came out and that made that environment that is not as diverse as it was before. Because a lot of people that started with web development like I did with like really terrible browsers we want to write things that last longer. We want to write things that are readable in 10 years' time and not code that just works. Code that just works feels to me like working against nothing. I've got, I think it's nowadays really hard to put a portfolio together as a developer because what you released is changed a week later. So it's really tough to, find a, uh, to, to show something later on <laughs> to somebody else. And it's a world of keeping employees in the office and busy. It feels... Um, when I talk to my parents about what I get for free in the office, they're like, this, there has to be something about this. Like, are you part of a cult? Like, no, because in IT it's normal to have like fizzy drinks, to have like food for everybody, to have like 
in, in, in Google, you get your washing done, you can bring in your laundry, your laundry is done for you. You can like uh, get cabs to drive you home, uh, but you probably just stay in the office because there's so much food to choose from, there's so much joy to choose from, and there's beer pong. You can even have your social life in the office. It feels so condescending, you know? It feels so like, all you guys are the same. We just give you plastic toys and some nibbles and please stay in the office and work for 68 hours per week. Is that even possible? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. It just feels we're, we're, we're locking people into this golden cage of like, let's make sure that you stay together and you do a lot of work and you stay in the office and you don't go out there and do this social life thing and have a real life. That's just terrible. And then we wonder when people get into each other's ways, when people, when you see each other too often, too long, you, you find things that you are annoyed about. And it might be unconscious biases, but it's just, high school is over. This is work. So no, if there's a beer pong table in an office, I'm not going to work there. I think this is just ridiculous because imagine you being a, being a mother of two that wants to come back into work and goes in there and there's a rowdy 19-year-old crowd playing beer pong in the office. You're like, what am I doing here? I'm an, am I the matron? These are my colleagues. I should rely on them and I should be the same as them, but I feel like I'm ostracized. I'm just not part of this. And it's a world of pandering to the bros and keeping the high school lifestyle. Like, it's all rock and roll. And it just drives me crazy because it's so not rock and roll. Because when you meet rock and roll people, it's different. Like, I always like when people say, oh, you're a rock and roll developer, a rock star developer. I just want to trash a cubicle and see what they make. You know, my, my favorite is ninja. Ninjas are not visible. If you see them, then they're shit. Then they're not ninja. Like, they're supposed to be killers, actually. They're supposed to be spies. Do you want to hire a spy into your office? No. Mavens, gurus, I don't even know what people come up with. But we, we push ourselves to be these awesome, awesome people. And it's all high school. It's not mature. It's not what you actually do for a living. Think about it. Like, if, you, if your job is your life, then something went wrong because your job might go away and you have to start a new life in every new job, a new social circle in every new job. You should have people outside of that as well. It's work hard, play hard, make money. It's those assholes from the 80s that we hate on television. You know, the investment bankers, the yuppies, and we've become that in IT. We're the richest people around at the moment. We're socially inept, according to the tech press. We have a problem integrating and talking to females and things like that. We've become the people that we hated that we tried to replace in the 90s. When I started as a web developer, everybody around me was an IBM developer on like frameworks and stuff. And they're like, oh, you web kids, HTML is not really a language. What are you doing? You know, and those are people that later on came like, JavaScript, I got to learn that. Can you help me with that? Uh, overall, I think it's a world that hinders diversity. Fast-paced, uh, competitive, locking people into an environment where they should be just talking to people that know the same things that they do. And this is what we have the problem with diversity. We have to actually understand that companies have to change, environments have to change. And I'm not the only one that actually uh, talks about this. Pete Warden wrote a great article about why nerd culture must die where he said that he was a nerd for his whole life. He met his wife in an online MMORPG and all kinds of things. But he just talks to people and he sees threads on GitHub and he sees on how people communicate with each other online and the hatred on the, the trolling on Twitter. And he's like, I don't, want to, I don't want to be part of this anymore. This is not what we started. We actually, we're behaving like the Rebel Alliance, but we're now really the Empire because we're the ones with power. And we don't use the power for good. We don't make a better work environment. We make a more secluded work environment where we just talk to each other. So I want you to fight for more diversity. I want you to go out and go into your first jobs or your second jobs or your internships. And I want you to actually show companies that just giving us enough nibbles and enough alcohol in the office is not a working environment. Like a beer pong table or a ping pong table is not a culture. A culture is more than that. A culture allows people from different environments to work with each other without anybody feeling left out, without anybody feeling attacked, and with people having other people to talk to that they need to talk to. So what can you do? First of all, you should mingle more. This is from the Google video that I talked about earlier. These are, uh, this is the social network inside Google. So every, they, they asked everybody, who do you talk to when you want to have professional advice? And the darker it is, the more people are talking to that person, and the lighter it is, and the more on the outside is, the less people are actually talking to each other. Now, the blue ones are the IT guys, the green ones are HR, and the red ones are sales. 
There's no intermingling between the green one and the blue ones. And this is HR. These are the people people. These are the people that you rely on if you get sick or if out of a sudden you have to go on holiday for two months because your mom's sick or something. And these are the people we never talk to. They talk more to the salespeople than to the IT people. And this, this is all about bias. This is all about prejudice. This is all about, like, why should I talk to a salesperson? They're all awful. No, not all of them are. They actually would probably be better at selling your product if they knew what you did. Our problem is always that they sell things that we can't deliver. But if we just talk to them about what we do and how we approach things, then they could sell things that are there as well. So mingle. In every company that you go to, talk to people not in your department and have them as your contacts. Keep them there. The best trick that I learned in every company, get to know the receptionist. No matter who you actually have to talk to, it goes through the receptionist sooner or later. So that person knows who to talk to. And it's just fun for them uh, to come in in the morning and talk to somebody that you know rather than just running past them. Like, oh, cold, 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 cold. Don't want to talk to you. Don't assume evil when the cause could be confusion. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of demonizing right now about like, oh my God, he said this because he was a white IT guy, and all of them are like that. People say stupid things. I say stupid things. I probably said a few stupid things today. If I do that, please call me out immediately. And immediacy is the most important thing, because if you don't call something out immediate then it becomes a story, then it becomes telephone, more things get added to it, things are forgotten, things can't be proven anymore, oh, I never said this, yes, you said that, and that's where a lot of HR problems come in. It's sometimes scary, some people are overwhelming, then talk to somebody else who's as overwhelming and say, like, I actually felt unhappy about that person saying that. At the same time, fear is not an incentive and discourages change, and fear works in both ways. You might be intimidated by somebody, you might be offended by something somebody said, but if you don't say something immediately and you make it a big story and you basically, for example, you report that person to HR and it becomes known and that person gets reprimanded, everybody else is worried. Nobody talks to each other at all anymore. It's like we cannot make people grow, we cannot make people overcome their biases by making them afraid of talking. We have to make them, teach them how to talk more cleverly and be not offensive. That's one way of doing that, not by making them fear talking. Teach and be an example. I love that quote, like, don't know who said it. Do not educate your children to be rich, educate them to be happy. So when they grow up, they know the value of things and not the price. And the money thing always cracks me up. Like every company that you go to will offer you a lot of money and a lot of shares. Like the shares, wow, that's worth. I got about $40,000 shares in Yahoo. Don't even know if they're worth anything right now anymore. I got shares in companies that don't exist anymore. But I, the knowledge that I learned in companies, the people that I knew, the people that I can go back to now if I have a certain problem, because I know their ethnic backgrounds, I know what they do, I know how they like, this is the value that I accumulated over the years. Call out bad behavior immediately, as I said. Don't stop and wait and then come back three weeks later and like, oh, actually, I felt bad about what you said. It's, there's nothing wrong with actually interrupting somebody and saying like, What's going on? Why did you say this? And if you make that emotional, it becomes more interesting. A good question to ask is, how would you feel if somebody said this about you, did that to you? And that's just a question that inspires thinking. And not just like, oh, don't say that. Like, what if, you, or what if I pointed out that you have ugly feet? What if I pointed out that you have a terrible accent as well? Make it hurtful for the, these people as well on an emotional level that they understand how much they hurt other people as well. Demand a work environment that invites diversity and beyond what's legally needed. Like, every company will tell you we've got an HR department. Every, conf every work contract has a lot of stuff in there that they promise you. Nobody knows how to enforce that stuff. I've, I just left the company. I asked them what my pension plan was. They had no idea that we had a pension plan. And I relied on that stuff. I just basically went in there. I want to code. I want to develop things. The rest, I think, is, come on, companies have been doing that for 50 years. So many startups don't have any idea what they're doing. And I had work contracts where I took out four or five paragraphs because they're not enforceable in Europe. There's a boilerplate contract from America. And they just, they just took them out without even asking me what the things were. And that just doesn't make me feel happy. This doesn't make me feel valued as an employee. It's like, oh, you're the coder guy, code. The rest, we don't care. We'll sort it out as needed. And you don't do that with social things. So is there a proper HR department and procedure? Who is the person to talk to if you feel discriminated? 
Do you know who to talk to? Do, can you trust that person? So getting to know your HR representative and seeing how they tick is a very, very important thing. Because if you get discriminated against, you should have somebody that is on your side. You shouldn't just have somebody who has to take out a rule book and like, oh, I don't know how we deal with that. Like, it's Steve, or we did that in the past. And you should trust these people. These are people, people, so get to know them. And if your company outsources the HR to another company, leave. That's just the silliest thing you can do. If you want to be a startup, then you should start a company. You shouldn't just start a product and put some people around it. Sooner or later, your people will be burned out, so they have to find a way to deal with that. What are the long-term benefits? Of course, you have free Coke, and you have free food, and you have free nibbles. What about a health plan that really makes sense? What about maternity leave? What if, what if you want to get pregnant? Or if your wife gets pregnant, do you want to be at home? Which company does that? Sweden is a different story. Like, what about paternity leave? Exactly, that's what I mean. Sweden is a, di well, Sweden is a different thing because it's actually by law a man has to have a certain time off when America could be a week and that's basically all you get. And I find that ridiculous because I mean I, I want people to have a life and do work. Is having a social life possible and encouraged? Is it the, uh, does your company and culturally feel that you're not part of the company if you don't stay every night till 10 o'clock and have beers with your colleagues? Is there something that actually we do for people outside the office that you do something for the families? And weirdly enough, factories like my dad used to work in, which are in human conditions to work in, they had Christmas parties for the family and the kids outside the factory in like a, a different place. These kind of things used to be there in the 70s and 80s and now they've gone away. So is it, ha is it possible to have a social life or are you supposed to be one of the tribe? So many startups I see look like cults to me, like you have to be one of them and stay in them your whole life or there's no way that you can have success in them. There's find danger signs in job postings. There's a great website called joblint.org and that one you can copy and paste job descriptions in and it shows you what might be a, a racial stereotype, what might be a sexist a, a, a warning sign, what might be something that just overvalues what developers should be like rather than understanding what people are doing. Run these through and then send the emails back to the companies and tell them about it. There's like gender words checking for like dads, dudes, and bro words looking for bros, programmer, crank, crush, dude, and so on and so forth. If anybody calls me a programmer, I just want to slap them. And I think it's very important to listen, help, and be nice to people and record as many good experiences as you can. I made a lot of money, well, enough money to live in, in IT, but the people that I met that I took out, that I went out for dinners with, that I met on holidays afterwards as well, that I can now rely on because I don't work for the company anymore, but I can still rely on as friends and when I need them. This is the real thing that you should start accumulating over the time. Money we have right now, it will crash though. I've, I've went through the first dot-com boom and lived in Los Angeles 1999, saw companies fall apart, saw people have nothing and next day. And the bubble that we live in right now feels a bit like that as well. So invest in human capital and invest in the people that might give you another job at another less exciting company, but a more reliable company later on as well. So send hugs from time to time and talk to people and record as many good experiences as you can. Look into the biases thing, look into like how to overcome your own. But in general, I think that's all I wanted to talk about. There's diversity is a thing that needs to be nurtured, not something that we can force. And I hope that you, going into the world out there and starting new companies, have now an idea what to force companies to, to think about, rather than like, oh, here's free beer, please code for us. Thanks very much.